the ordinances um, are pretty straightforward. Um, so yeah, tomorrow um, before the City Council's Criminal Justice Committee, there are going to be two um, criminal justice reform ordinances uh, to be discussed. Um, the first one is um, a summons in lieu of arrest. Um, and what this does is it, it does some, actually it's a very minor modification to the current um, municipal code. Um, currently the, the law does say that po the police are allowed to issue a summons in lieu of a custodial arrest. And so when I say custodial arrest, what I mean is like actually taking somebody in handcuffs, putting them in a police car, taking them to jail, booking them, etc. So the police are um, under our current law allowed to issue a summons instead of doing that. And a summons is just, you know, a notification saying, hey, you know, you've been cited for this charge and here's the court date that you need to come back by. Um, however, the current law, while it does list some specific criteria that should guide the decision making um, of an individual officer on the street, it has um, a catch-all category um, that just gives the officer essentially total discretion as to whether or not to do a custodial arrest or just to issue a summons. And so what we have um, brought forward and, and what the city council is um, going to be considering is an amendment to that. So the police will still have the authority to do a custodial arrest um, and, and, oh, I forgot, let me back up. The ordinance only applies to misdemeanors and it only applies to nonviolent charges. It does not apply to domestic violence. It doesn't apply to anything like that, okay? So this is just nonviolent misdemeanors. Um, but uh, the amendment requires that if the police decide to do a custodial arrest, that they uh, do it for specific reasons that are in the law. Those are already in the law. But basically what they go to is whether or not that person is likely to come back to court. So if somebody were to say, you know, forget it, tear up their summons, I'm not coming back, you know what I mean? Or something along those lines where the police officer really didn't have faith that the person was gonna come back to court, then they could proceed with custodial arrest. The same goes for anybody that the police determine is going to be a danger to themselves or the community, right? Um, so they can still do custodial arrests. And all that it requires um, is that they fit it into one of the categories, they're very broad and they align with the constitution, um, and um, that they make a note of that contemporaneously in their police report. So it's not about a bunch of extra paperwork, it's not about a bunch of work. And in fact, it's less work to issue a summons than perform a custodial arrest. So that's sort of the basic um, framework of the ordinance. The other part of the ordinance is that it, um, it asks that the police, when they are booking somebody on a misdemeanor um, that could be charged in municipal court that they use the municipal court um, uh, code article rather than the state court code article so that the cases can go to municipal court so that they can move more efficiently um, and that that frees up the district court to be able to handle the more serious cases, which is very important given sort of the overload right now dealing with um, the, the backlog of getting things set and being able to proceed in accordance with social distancing recommendations. So that's sort of the, you know, the basis, I mean, that's, that's the, the summons ordinance um, as it's laid out. So um, why are we bringing this or why, why is this coming before the city council? So there have been numerous calls um, from several community groups um, to try to get the police to rely on using summonses for these low-level nonviolent charges. And to a certain extent, there, there's been an impact. And, and I definitely um, you know, give credit to the city and the police for doing that. But there's still lots of people coming through arrested on small misdemeanor charges. And so what, what happens when those people come through, right, is they may be in jail for 12 hours, they may be in jail for 24 hours, they may be in jail for longer if there's a bond set that they can't afford, et cetera. Um, but, but they're definitely in jail for some time period and then they're released because these are not, you know, serious dangerous charges that people need to be detained on. Um, and so when you have people cycling in and out of the jail, you're contributing to 
the spread of the virus, COVID-19, from the jail to the larger community. And I'm not a uh, health, uh, public health expert, right? Um, but we will have some people on hand to provide some information about that at the council tomorrow because there have been some studies um, that show, that link community spread directly to um, <clears throat> jails and people cycling in and out of the jail. So what happens when somebody is arrested? That person is put in handcuffs, right? So there's already some contact with the police officers on the street, thereby, you know, the police are having to get closer to that person, um, thereby possibly exposing our officers to any, um, anything from that person and having the arrested person exposed to anything that the police officer may be carrying. Then they're placed in a police car. <clears throat> Um, sometimes they're taken to a station where they are in uh, mixing with other um, staff and other police officers, other staff of NAPD, thereby exposing other members of our police force to COVID, thereby having them be exposed to anything that the officers may be carrying. Then they're taken to jail where they interact with um, our sheriff's deputies. We've already lost some of our sheriff's deputies to the virus. Um, and so that's obviously um, a big concern and a huge tragedy. Um, there they go through many processes, like um, from the administrative paperwork, things of that nature, but they also have to interact with the medical staff in the jail. Then they interact with the other um, people who have been arrested, the other people that are locked up in the jail. Then they have to, you know, sometimes they have to interact with deputies again to be able to go through a court process. And the ability of the jail to really quarantine every single person that comes through, it just doesn't exist. The jail isn't built that way. Um, so even if they wanted to have the most um, informed protocols in place, they don't have the resources to do that. That's not how jails are set up. Um, I think that um, when, uh, when the, you know, the pandemic first started, there was a lot of concern about spread in, um, in jails and prisons. And, and I think that was just sort of based on some common sense ideas about, you know, people being in close proximity, people not having access to um, hygiene um, uh, things and, and being able to, you know, have a clean space or social distance. But I think that it's been borne out that that wasn't, you know, that was a hypothesis, but it's been more borne out that it was an accurate one because we've seen um, there constantly um, being um, infections in the jail. There still are, um, there still is spread in the jail um, happening right now. So this really is not just a criminal justice reform, this is a public safety initiative for our entire community. Because keep in mind, once those people get out of jail, um, they're gonna go back to the community, right? And when those police officers are having to take people in and out of the jail and the people that work at the jail are coming back and forth, we are going to continue to see community spread. When we continue to see community spread, we're gonna remain shut down and our, um, you know, our, our economy and our health are gonna continue to suffer. So I think this is um, really an exciting initiative because it's really just a small change in the law that can really protect people's safety um, and really reduce a lot of the resources that we're using um, to arrest people who don't need to be arrested because they're just gonna turn around and be released immediately anyway. Um, so that's that's kind of the the the, the summons. Um, I would say in a nutshell, but I guess I've gone on for quite a while. So I don't know if anybody has any questions about that before I talk about the the other ordinance. Uh, I think there was one question just about the 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 kind of level of discretion um, uh, that. Um, uh, I'll just read it. Um, will the ordinance amendment have provisions that reduce the potential of racial inequities or will it be completely at the discretion of the officer? So I think you said uh, if, if previously the discretion had no limits, meaning it could be entirely arbitrary, now it has to conform to some aspect in the law already. Um, do you feel like that yeah. does enough to address the possibility that, that, um, that discretion still could be abused and misused in ways that, that reflect, you know, yeah, no, implicit I think racism, great, whatever. No, that's a really smart question. And, and here's the deal, right? I mean, yes and no. 
Um, having some specific parameters, right, I think is definitely going to help us address some of the racial disproportionality and who is arrested and also between who is issued a summons and who is taken into the jail. So I definitely think it's a step in the right direction. Do I think that it's going to solve all of the, the racial disproportionality and in, in, in arrests on misdemeanors? No, I don't. But what I do think is that we've heard a lot from um, Superintendent Ferguson about how he wants to make some changes and he wants to improve and he wants to do better. And I think this is really an opportunity for him to get behind this because this is a tool, right, that the police can use. Every time they're making a note about why they did, a did an arrest, versus a summons, that's a data point, right? That they can keep, that they can measure, right? That they can keep track of to see where are the trends? How can we improve? How can we, uh, you know, build upon this to uh, serve our, our city better? So yeah, I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. I don't think it's a panacea to racism in the criminal justice system, I'll just be honest. But yeah, I think that's a, a smart question. All right, so why don't we go on to the next one and then, and then have some time uh, uh, to, to, to have some Q&A. And if, if you could try to uh, uh, keep this one to about seven or eight minutes so that we have enough time to really kind of chew this and, and still talk among ourselves. Um, uh, but go ahead. Yeah. So um, the, other, um, the other ordinance is about early access to body camera footage. Um, this ordinance um, specifically, uh, it's really just about taking out the middleman. When somebody gets arrested, um, their, their lawyer uh, will be able to access any of the body cam. Um, uh, by body cam, I mean the body-worn cameras that the police wear um, on, on their chest um, and the um, footage from any dash cam from the police car. So it's basically just like when somebody gets arrested, they'll be able to access that information right away so that their lawyer can use it um, to fulfill you know, their Sixth Amendment duty to investigate um, and present the best case. There's really no need for um, people to have to wait you know, months. Many of those months are spent in jail um, waiting for the district attorney to turn this information over. There's no reason why it can't go directly um, to the lawyers who are representing people who have been arrested. Um, and I think that um, it's important, right? I think a lot of times people get confused and think like, oh, the police work for the DA. Well, they don't, right? They work for all of us. Um, and so there's really no need for the DA to be in the middle and be a gatekeeper for information um, that's already out there. This isn't gonna require any money, anything, you know, all that it is is just a link um, that they can automatically send to the attorney. Um, for the arrested person, and it will help cases move a lot more quickly. Um, you know, they, people can make decisions about how to resolve cases more quickly, and you can protect people's constitutional rights um, more uh, readily. Also, currently, um, the use of body cam um, is part of the NOPD policy under the consent decree, and this would make it actually law. So um, this is just something that protects all of our citizens, and also it protects police officers from any sort of false accusations, or if there's ever an incident where, God forbid, there's, um, they have to use use of force, this protects them as well. So um, this will also be heard tomorrow. Okay, let me ask um, uh, Chris Weaver just to just to share your question that you put in the chat, or uh, any other ones. Thank you, I appreciate it. She did answer my question, and I do understand it won't eliminate racial disparities. Uh, but uh, you know, if an office still has uh, discretion, obviously there's some concern about that. But in relationship to the body cameras, I don't know if the audience already addresses this, but uh, if it's if the body cam footage will be available immediately to the attorneys, will there be a restriction or a time frame or some type of criteria that will prevent them from le releasing it to the media? Um, like prevent the attorney from releasing to the media? Correct. Um, I think that Honestly, I think that there's nothing in the ordinance that would preclude any lawyer. So um, 
somebody working for the district attorney's office, somebody working for the police, or somebody that representing somebody that was arrested from litigating um, certain reasons why something shouldn't be released or why certain things should be redacted or you know whether there's maybe limitations where a, a lawyer could do something um, for to, to defend somebody but not release it out. And there are limitations like that in other places in the law, but those are things that a judge would have an opportunity to evaluate in accordance with the Constitution and, and other parts of the law. So that is always something that can, can be litigated and can be addressed on a case-by-case -case issue. So for example, if there was something of a sensitive nature um, with you know a victim or something like that or a child or something like that, right? then there would definitely be um, an opportunity for anybody to go to the court and say, hey, we want to comply with the law, but we have some concerns. Can we do some carve outs here? I don't know, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Uh, and that's all of my questions for right now, sir. Thank you. Right. You, you also asked a, a helpful question though, I think, uh, maybe the, the um, Actually, I'm sorry, that was, that was Ms. Sheridan's question. Uh, so I'll let Ms. Sheridan ask you. Go ahead, Cynthia. Oh, yeah, thanks, Meg. I was wondering, if it sounds like content for And I was wondering if there is pushback uh, on them or if you think they'll, there's broad support. I'm sorry, you were breaking up there at the beginning. I think... You might have a bad connection, but I think she's saying, uh, is there pushback or resistance to these measures? I, I assume, uh, Cynthia, you're asking kind of among the police and the other um, folks that you might imagine might have some pushback, or is this something that has broad support, including um, among uh, the police department and, and DA's office? Right. I think somebody else's microphone is going off. Uh, but, uh, that that's better okay. um so what i was trying to figure out was do you need action to support these or uh do you think they're going to be you know presented to the council i was just trying to figure out if we need to be prepared to um, back up the things that sound like common sense right yep sorry um yeah uh, yes, I do think that I do think that we need all hands on deck because nothing is guaranteed, right? And this isn't going to require anybody to, you know, comment and expose themselves to the virus because it's going to be online and there's going to be an opportunity for people to submit public comment. Now, I don't need everybody to write a treatise, but if this is something that you think that you support as a New Orleanian, then I definitely encourage you to lend your voice to it um, and and you know put in some public comment and have have your name behind it because you know if somehow there's confusion or for some reason there's there is pushback and people don't support it then I feel like it's good to just be on record like supporting something that's common sense that you think will help protect your family and your fellow citizens so I mean I definitely encourage everybody to get involved I also think that um, it's just good for the city council to see you know what I mean that like everybody's kind of holed up in their homes, but just to see that, you know, people are involved, people are excited and people want to help them um, make improvements. So I, I definitely encourage everybody to get involved. I also think that, you know, it's just a good way to kind of see how these things are going to play out um, with our social distancing and what is it like to participate in a city council meeting um, during COVID. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I really applaud the city council for allowing people to submit public comment, um, online because, um, the process in the state legislature was a little bit different. And so I definitely, um, think it's great that they're doing that. I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's democracy. So I say jump in if, if you're, if you're in favor, I think that's great. So these are going to a committee discussion tomorrow, it sounded like, um, yes. So I, I've never logged into a city council meeting and have no idea how we do public comment. So if you could say a few words about how we might make our voices known, that would be helpful. Sure. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of double checking on some of the logistics. So I'll definitely make sure that nothing's um, changed with it and I can get back um, um, uh, to Broderick and he can share with y'all um, if anything's uh, uh, different, but there's a link um 
to on the city council page and what will happen is that they'll um, present some information about the ordinances there'll be some brief testimony and then what they normally do is they take a little break um, to allow people to kind of get their thoughts together and you just type in your comments um, through a link on um, the city council page but I can resend all of that um, I'm just um, double checking with some of the staff from city council to make sure that I have all of that right because I don't want there to be any hitches. I know Zoom can be, Zoom and links and all that stuff can be kind of stressful and I don't want anybody to miss out an opportunity to, to sh lend their voice to this. So um, I'll work and just on, to, on that. Just to clarify, is it your understanding that the, the, the public comment is just in writing or can you actually testify like we are right now within a time frame? So yeah, no, it's going to be in it's going to be in writing, and then there'll be um, somebody there to read it out loud. So it's my advice that you keep it brief. Um, I think if you have three points that you want to make, um, I think that maybe you just pick one. Um, I think if you feel like you have a unique perspective, um, you know, maybe you have a medical background, or maybe you've had somebody involved in the system, um, you know, or just anything that you think maybe is a little bit different, then share that so that they can see, um, you know, why this, why these appeal to so many um, different members of our community. So yeah, I would definitely say keep it short. Um, all right, uh, let me see if there are any other questions um, um, and um, including from our, our, our friends from the media. Um, and uh, we will spend a little time um, kind of thinking through how we want to approach this, who may want to testify. Um, let, me, let me just say something in terms of broad context. Um, the, um, um, systems that have been at work for many, many decades have deep roots right? It is not only a uh, shortage of technical knowledge. It's not usually a matter of happenstance or accident, whether certain policies are in place or not in place. They reflect interests and they reflect power. Uh, and part of what we want to be doing as an organization not over the next weeks and months, but over the years <laughs> is creating roots that go as deep as those practices, because yep. that is what it's going to take to uproot them. Uh, um, uh, and, and if I may, Caddo Parish is a little bit of a cautionary tale. Four years ago, there was a DA's race that had a reformer against a real retrograde guy and the reformer won. Huzzah. And you know what changed? Not much of anything. Uh, so it would be real easy, and I know I'm getting ahead of tomorrow, uh, <laughs> it, but it would be real easy to say, oh, well, um, uh, the, the person who had become kind of the symbol for, um, uh, you know, I'm going to say it, uh, a bit of a retrograde approach to criminal justice policy out of step with the political uh, preferences and, 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 uh, uh, norms of good practice, uh, he's not running. Um, that likely doesn't matter a whole lot unless there's a constituency of people who don't have any skin in the game uh, who are going to work pretty tirelessly to understand that system, to support things that make sense. I mean, there's a lot of things that just make sense that are real hard to get done. Uh, and, 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 and let me just turn this into a question. Uh, a couple of years ago in Chicago, uh, the mayor of Chicago, uh, quite famously, didn't release a piece of uh, body camera, right? Um, uh, Rahm Emanuel, uh, and, and it was very much tied to his electoral interest, at least the interpretation that I had, um, uh, the, or have heard. The, what this, this sounds like the second measure would prevent that, right? I mean, it would make it that there's a standard, it has to be released, it can't be manipulated based on public relations uh, uh, or, 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 or political gains. Is that a part of its uh, intent, just to make sure that this is a, a more open and objective process? 
Absolutely. Um, I, you know, if, uh, once somebody is arrested, then, um, theoretically you should have enough evidence against them to make their case or you shouldn't have arrested them. So, um, there shouldn't be really any objection or any issue with passing that on. I mean, this is, um, this body cam was put into place to protect all of us and, and OPD works for all of us. So I think that, um, we should be able to have access to it. Um, yeah. But once again, I, I want to just underscore this isn't just about going after the police and saying that all the police are bad, right? This also protects the police and helps them. And for example, the summons ordinance, these are people that are having to make calls on the street on the spur of the moment with, you know, all kinds of different things going on, you know, with different um, they're dealing with people, right? You know, it's a human endeavor. So it's definitely um, a lot that we ask of them. And this theoretically should make it easier for them because it provides a framework it provides some criteria um to guide them in their decision making so this isn't just about like oh the cops are terrible let's beat up on the cops it's not what this is right this is just about following things that make sense for everyone and, and and in fact from what you and a couple others have shared um it's a time when there's been some significant reforms and some of these measures at least in part are in place because of a consent decree right but a consent decree is enforced uh as long as there's a a, a a a federal monitor making sure it's enforced and so some of this is kind of to institutionalize and if i'm putting words in your mouth and tell me to no, it's not it but i mean it's to institutionalize some of the good practices that have already started to develop is that fair yes um, <laughs> okay fair. so so, um, so let's my take understanding a, a, sounds, sorry go ahead no no go ahead go ahead um, it's my understanding, and I, and I can't call up the studies and the statistics. I'm not as much of a policing expert, but you know we do have our police monitor here in New Orleans. But it's my understanding that a lot of cities where there has been um, consent decrees, it's like once the consent decree goes away, if some of those things aren't um, you know put into law, um, then a lot of the 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 strides um, and a lot of the the progress can go away. And I would hate to see that because I definitely think we're in a much better place than, than we used to be. We have a very ugly um, history here in New Orleans. And I, I do concede that there's been some significant improvement. So Ms. Hattie Broussard, I'm going to give you maybe not the last word, but close to it. Just, just ask your question. Um, and then let me ask Reverend uh, Johnson. Uh, and if, if Judge Johnson can, uh, can pipe in, if he, gets permission from his mother-in-law for just a minute, uh, just to, to get his reaction to that. And then we'll we'll just uh, debrief for about the next eight minutes. Uh, Ms. Broussard. Yeah, hi, Megan. Um, I remember you from juvenile yes. court. <laughs> How yes. are you, Ms. Hattie? I'm, I'm nice good, you. I'm good. So I was wondering who who is proposing these two changes? Who wrote them and, and submitted them? Or is it from coming inside the city council staff or what? Um, so actually, I mean, I think that it was a collaborative process. Um, you know, there are, there are people from several community groups. I mean, we, you know, uh, our, our office definitely, um, lots of lawyers collaborated on looking at them and researching them, but, you know, we also work with the MacArthur Justice Center. Um, you know, there's a whole group of people, um, working together, um, the OPPRC, Court Watch, um, vote um the police monitor um everybody really kind of shared and and vetted a lot of this stuff um but the lawyers at opd did you know a lot of the research and writing they're being introduced by council member williams um but we we did that and we you know they're really informed by our experience and and how things kind of move through the system and just kind of looking at how they do things in other jurisdictions okay great thank you uh pastor johnson any thoughts reactions to this well, as I listen to it, um, the, what you're trying to present sounds good. The, the thing is, uh, uh, is the chief going to be monitoring this to, to see how his police force is uh, handling this if they go with the summons, especially with the, in lieu of the arrest of summons, to see if it's being done uh, equally and, and not one-sided. Uh, and then the other thing is... Uh, if everybody's going to be on on board with it, uh, they have to be totally, totally for it, and totally on board, and and not just speak, say the words they they on board, but uh, does no does no follow up to make sure everything is working uh, according 
to um, what the uh, the plan is. Yes, that's true. Um, laws don't enforce themselves. None of them do, right? Yeah. The doesn't enforce hey. themselves. Hey, can I step in here a little bit? Sure. Uh, Court Watch probably will be, well, I can't say probably, will be monitoring this um, actively. Um, we currently monitor Municipal Court Clinic right now as we speak. And so we will be monitoring whether or not this is happening. We'll be taking the race, the charges, what they're getting arrested for. Um, and so we're monitoring that. And actually, we tweet out what they what's happening right now during COVID. So we're watching. Right. Okay. Um, Thank you. J Judge Johnson, can you uh, break in for a second here? I might have lost him. Ooh, I'm having all kinds of uh, internet issues here in my house with the weather, I guess. But yes, I can. One of the things that Meg said about, uh, uh, about Bidacam, and the, the New Orleans Police Department has done a tremendous job with EPIC, with ethical policing. It will be be wonderful for for New Orleanians to see cops, to see policemen do their job, and see how they do it and how well they do it. Will give this community a whole different kind of flavor as regards what NOPD does. So that that is good for police. It's not bad, and and it's good for this community. It absolutely is good, and so that's the thing we need to seriously encourage is to see for us to see police in action doing a job and doing it very well thank you and and let me say a word about you uh, uh judge johnson uh uh I, I might be remiss if i if i called you the grandfather of criminal justice reform but i i, I will say you are the forebear okay of criminal justice reform or at least one of them in the city and has been chairing the people's da coalition which is a group that is, has, has been doing a lot of legwork and research to determine kind of a job description of a DA uh, and what policies he or she would pursue that would really bring about a more efficient, more effective, more just criminal justice system, not to pick a candidate, but to establish a mandate. Um, uh, we've uh, worked kind of in, in, in very much in the background, but supporting that effort, and, and want over the next few weeks and months, Judge Johnson, if you're open to it, to engage much more deeply and understand what you have learned, uh, uh, where we can move from the platitudes to kind of, you know, specific policies and, and use that to try to build uh, a, a way to educate ourselves as citizenry. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask if you would come in, in a few weeks and do one of these like Miss Garvey um, uh, uh, in, in, in preparation for, uh, for that election season. Absolutely. And that, again, no, what, we, what we have done and, and intend to go forward with is not any as regards any particular candidate, but as regards how we think about the district attorney's job, what we think that job should be and how it should be, and not allow ourselves to fall into the Shreveport piece in terms of not being able to monitor, not being able to have metrics, not being able to, in fact, uh, have deliverables from the district attorney going forward as regards transparency, as regards transparency, as regards ethical, and uh, uh, the DA is operating in an ethical and an, accounting, and an accountable fashion. That's what it's about. And, the, and for the, again, New Orleans to see, for the citizens of our city to see how the district attorney's office operates. That's our goal. All right. Um, Meg, uh, well, Derwin, you, you got anything to add um, uh, or, or uh, suggest for us? No, I think, I think you've had sort of great folks already speak on this stuff to the, to the, conversation around how do we inject more, more equity and, and racial uh, justice into our system. I think part of the foundation that gets laid by these changes is that we have to insist upon uh, metrics and, thing, and, and measures. We have to be, we can't be afraid to write down and be able to keep track of people's race, gender, identity um, and be able to report out on that 
so we can see what are the policing patterns when it comes to the ordinances, uh, particularly when it comes to um, the, the summons in lieu of arrest, because it's going to narrow, it doesn't specifically say it's going to help with any disparities, but it will, in fact, limit the interactions and the kinds of um, potentially hostile interactions between our neighbors, our citizens, and the police, which is going to certainly help when it comes to folks of color, people in black and brown neighborhoods in New Orleans. But also we have to insist they keep track of what they're doing, who they stop, who they talk to, uh, who they summons. And when it comes to the body cam, I think the points of watching the police do their job uh, and do it well will change how people think about police. But we also need to be mindful and pay attention to the language they use uh, when they interact with citizens, um, how many how many body cams that get released uh, are 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 dealing with black and brown communities in our in our, uh, in our New Orleans, and so a lot of that I think is going to lay the foundation for what may be maybe deeper reforms that specifically target equity uh, in in our legal system. All right, thank you so much. Um, uh, if I could ask uh, our guests and, and, and members of the media, uh, although I, I told you I'd give you a chance to Travers, uh, and sorry, who was from the lens? Are they still on? Karen, was that you? Anyway, um, did you have any questions you wanted to ask or just uh, get the fit, uh, footage, Travers? The footage is fine. That's okay, is there fine. anybody who's not comfortable uh, uh, being in that footage? Uh, and, 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 and you might just need to let Mr. Mackle know that now, and we probably should have established it beforehand, but he might respect that. Uh, uh, would that be okay if somebody chooses not to be? Uh, uh, is there anybody who, uh, okay, I'm not seeing anything, but uh, if that is We're the case, We're probably just gonna use know. a lot of comments from Meg Garvey, so it, Perfect. it's Good. humanized okay. to see anybody else. Great, all right. Um, uh, I, I'd like to ask uh, uh, the, the our friends in the media and 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 Meg and the other folks with with your office to uh, to hop off uh, and kind of leave the rest of us just to reflect a little bit and then and we're gonna uh, mainly just talk about what we want to uh, uh, do tomorrow um, and talk about one next step. So thank y'all so much for 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 joining us on very short notice and and having a very informative, helpful, um, enlightening conversation. And we hope it's the first of many uh, that we can have going forward.